All right, so Nikki and I are here to talk a little bit about uh, PMC's transition over to using Gutenberg as the principal editor for our sites. Um, so the, the number one question we get about this is, you know, why did you decide to do this? Why now? Um, you know, did you think Gutenberg was ready? That sort of thing. And there's, you know, obviously a handful of reasons why. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, one, that I think the real kind of kick in the pants to get it done was uh, WordPress VIP telling us that we had to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but beyond that, we, we came up with a few other good reasons why it might be a good idea for us. Um, you know, at the point that we started on this, uh, Aaron Jorben, who's a big advocate for Gutenberg and also part of our team at PMC for a little while longer, uh, he is, you know, felt like it was uh, the right time and the right shift for us to make and made a great case for it. There, in addition to that, um, you know, there is the aspect of using more modern technologies in our CMS. We don't want it to feel old. We don't want it to feel you know, like someone comes to work for our brands and you know, they might be used to WordPress from a different uh, company or doing their own blogging. We didn't want them to feel like they were taking a step backwards in time. Uh, and so I also feel like it's really important to stay on that modern front, uh, and not only for editorial teams, but also for our engineering teams and product teams. So just being able to work on new technologies uh, some of the you know more advanced JavaScripts and React that uh, comes under the hood under the hood with Gutenberg, um, you know I think are really great for keeping people on engineering teams engaged and interested. Um, and Gutenberg had been evolving enough that we also felt like it was just the right time. It was mature enough, more or less stable enough, <laughs> uh, and. Um, knowing that it was also going to be a very long road to, to get all of our sites switched over to using Gutenberg. You know, it was basically at the start of the road, by the time we got to the end, we felt like it would be even more mature and more ready. Um, and potentially, you know, we'd be able to contribute back uh, some of the changes that we wanted to introduce uh, to, to sort of help our own brands selfishly. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we took a look at our sites to figure out, like, of the brands, what, what's the scope look like? How many do we need to shift over? Um, how big of a project is this? Uh, so we did choose you know, essentially the, the primary sites that do a lot of content publishing on the regular that our team is responsible for maintaining. Uh, and then we had a handful that we realized, no, these aren't necessarily good fits for it, uh, or our team doesn't really directly work on them. In some cases, like South by Southwest, they're not even using WordPress. Um, so we were able to kind of, you know, narrow down the scope a bit to something that made sense for us. Yeah, so one of the biggest questions we get when we talk about our move over to Gutenberg is, how did you get buy-in? You know, this impacts hundreds of editors. It's not a small change, it's not a quick change. You know, and ultimately, it's even as we move forward with our ongoing development, as we're learning you know, about developing in Gutenberg, things will slow down a little bit from a development point of view. So this is pretty much how I approach every kind of stakeholder buy-in uh, session with the fingers crossed praying, praying, you know. But actually, we took it really slow with this buy-in approach. So we didn't just turn up one day and said, hey, we've got to do this thing called Gutenberg, and it has to happen next year, and, and we're going to do it. So, you know, tough, we're off. You know, we started planting the seed years ago, as soon as Gutenberg started to become something that was really being discussed, um, you know, out in the WordPress community, we started talking about it. We started, you know, we started talking a little bit about the flexibility that it can give our editors and our editorial staff in certain use cases where it's appropriate. And, you know, we started talking about how we want to be able to limit it so that we don't end up, we don't have the risk of anyone going in and completely changing the home page or an article page or you know, kind of controlling that flexibility to be very useful use cases. We also started a, a little bit of a grassroots campaign as well. So in meeting with our brand stakeholders, a lot of times they are saying, we want, we want things like hubs. You know, we want to be able to easily spin up a way to group our content together, but you know, you got, it takes a while to go through the development flow. And there's other things that we want to use our actual development resources for. So we started kind of really, you know, kind of dropping the concept of Gutenberg in with these stakeholders, saying, hey, this new WordPress editor is coming. And I will say that we didn't use the, the term Gutenberg too much at the start. 
we kind of phrased it as a new upgraded WordPress editor because Gutenberg sounds scary, we don't know what it is, you know, it sounds like an entirely new CMS. So we really kind of phrased it to say this upgrade is coming and when that comes, your life will be easier for these reasons. So we started at the top, but we also started, you know, at the lower levels, the people out there using the content management system every single day. Um, you know, we, the other thing as well is that we really emphasized that it, as well as a technical change, this was gonna be very impactful for editors and that we would be thoughtful about it. We wouldn't wake up one day, switch things over, and then hope for the best when everyone came in to do their day job. So we said, we will spend a long time focusing on communications and training. This will be very thought out and it will go over many years. And we will phase it. We won't, just, we won't try and do everything at once. We'll start small, we'll learn. We'll expand up, we'll learn. And so we get to the point where we are ready to finally start switching you know, the core tasks over across all of our brands. Um, you know, so I think some of that reassurance kind of helped us get the buy-in over a long period of time. And also that hard deadline uh, you know, made it quite non-negotiable when we were talking to our execs as well. So talking a little bit about the phases, and there's a lot of detail on this slide, so I'm not going to talk massively in a load of, of detail. Um, but essentially what we decided to do is we realized that one of the scariest kind of things about transitioning over to Gutenberg was actually converting our existing features over into the new editor. You know, because A, that is going to be something that editors are going to have to learn how to do different workflows. And also, we're going to have to learn how to technically convert things over. So we actually started with a, like a bit of an R&D phase back in 2020, um, where we were, we were looking at developing a new feature that we don't have currently in Gutenberg uh, from scratch. So and we focused on one brand as well. As you saw, we're a you know, portfolio, we've got lots of brands. So we found one brand that's very amenable to trying things with us, working through um, you know, new features. And we started building out this concept of like a hub kind of feature for this one brand. We learned, and that was a really good way for us to learn what this means for editors, you know, what it means to develop in Gutenberg, things to be aware of. So we, and once we did that in 2020, the year later, we kind of started to expand that new feature out to other brands. And again, it's a great way to kind of get a little bit more of that grassroots campaign as well out there to say, hey, like when, when brands start using it and they're like, actually, this is really useful. You know, it, it gives me more flexibility where I need it. So we rolled it out to more brands. Again, not everyone, to be honest, at that stage. We went for a select few brands that we knew could cope with this and were, had the appetite for it. And as we got into you know, this year, right at the start of this year, this is when we really started intensifying, looking at converting converting the post types and um, you know, our features that are using the, the tiny MCE over to, to Gutenberg and really thinking about how we then roll things out to the brands. So doing the equivalent of what the classic editor was in Gutenberg and getting that ready to then do a very fast rollout. And over the summer this year, we had a, we had a fantastic team who worked across um, you know, it was 12 sites. We had some other redesign projects going on at the same time that were handling the conversion. And we went into a very, very quick rollout phase. We started with some of our smaller brands with that full transition, the brands that have more simple sites, the brands that, you know, are a little bit less needy or noisy. Um, and we, we, we batched those up into doing a, a couple of sites a month. So over a four month period, you know, the first batch was three, then we did two, and then we did four, you know, kind of grouping brands together based on how much custom, how many custom post types or how much more custom development we'll need to do for each of those sites, um, as well as kind of thinking about the handholding and noise level that's going to come from each brand as well. So we got through that kind of the end of last, uh, end of September, we're now in November. And so what we're now looking at is our phase four, which is kind of our, okay, this thing has now been out in the wild, you know, but for our core publishing tasks for a good couple of months now, for, you know, for four, for four months for some of our brands. So now it's been used in real life, gathering user feedback, doing interviews, getting focus groups to think about some improvements and things that we want to do to, you know, really make sure those core publishing tasks are as smooth as they can be within the new Gutenberg interface. So we really did kind of phase it out over you know, two and a half years, as you can see here. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about some learnings from that and how we think we could have structured it a bit differently, but that was our approach uh, for this. So one thing we did figure out at the beginning is we, you know, it was going to be a multi-phase project. Um, you know, we, uh, as you can see from the slide, we spent a lot of time on the R&D phase. This was us uh, figuring out what we were doing, learning Gutenberg, learning the right way to translate features and content um, over to using it. 
you know, I think in hindsight, um, if we did this over again, it would have been a lot better to shorten that R&D phase as much as we could and spend a lot more time doing the conversion and planning. Um, you know, one of the reasons for that is that meant that our conversion and subsequent rollouts ended up, you know, having a more compressed time frame, uh, which meant, um, you know, our bosses got a little bit impatient with our, our timelines. Uh, we had less leeway for the delivery um, the, as a result of that. And, uh, and also we were just in a, a more of a crunch period where we were just focused on getting the main features out the door, which meant more bugs, more issues. Uh, and it would have been better if that was a little bit more balanced. Uh, additionally, um, that led to some delivery challenges, which <laughs> Nikki's going to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, and this is my favorite Slack emoji of all time because this is me 95% of the time. Uh, I am going to, before it drives you all crazy, I will, I will stop that. Um, yeah, so, you know, we did, we did experience some pretty significant delivery challenges, you know, throughout this process. It's not a small thing to tackle, um, and it's something that is extremely impactful to a lot of people. So, you know, one of the things, one of the challenges, and some of these were in our control, some of them were out of our control, but I think we had some learnings about how we handled them. So one of the challenges was, you know, we had some, it was, a two, it was over two and a half years, you know, we had some turnover on our tech team. Um, and because I think we approached it very much trying to keep a core group of people focused on this conversion, this switchover, um, what it actually meant was we didn't really get, you know, kind of a great amount of in-house expertise built up on the technology, on the, on the engineering side. So the combination of trying to keep those people on it and then when they leave, they take a lot of knowledge with them, you know, I think is something that was, was hard for us to, um, you know, make sure that we can recover from quickly and, and especially moving into the, to the, to the rollout phase. We did take a, a, a miss turn um, trying to make Gutenberg work with our existing de design system, which is something that we're actually upgrading, replacing right now. So, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. If we'd known, you know, that was going to happen. But also we, we did go down a little bit of a rabbit hole for something technically that I think also kind of lines back to what Gabriel was just saying about having a little bit more oversight during that R&D phase, making sure that we weren't rabbit holing, making sure that we were, we were thinking strategically about some of the decisions that were being made. Um, and this is something that we can definitely talk about after the talks if anyone's interested, because this was a very interesting experience. And the one thing that I really felt as well is, you know, this essentially this is a program of work, right? It's two and a half years. And when you have kind of limited delivery or what feels like not so many wins, especially in those early phases, it's really, really impactful on team morale. You know, having teams that feel like they've been plugging away for months, months, years, and they're not getting that, yeah, you did it. They're not getting that satisfaction of like a launch, a traditional launch is really, really, really tough. And that's something that I think really kind of impacted not just the team as a whole, but also, you know, they're fatigued. You know, I think we'd be able to get fresh eyes and fresh brains and be more strategic about how we swap uh, resources in and out. Then I think, you know, that challenge could have been handled a little bit better. And, um, you know, that speaks also to kind of that middle phase where it would have been nice to give some wins during that because essentially we got one win out early, and then it was a very long period of time before we really delivered anything else. Uh, so on the engineering front, um, you know, one of the bigger challenges is uh, moving over to the system where only a subset of my team really understands what that system works like and how to develop within it. Um, so that's something we're still working on is just building up those skills in-house so that we can continue to maintain this. Uh, you know, in addition to that, I think we underestimated the amount of continual, continuing updates and changes that Gutenberg is going, to, going through, uh, including feature deprecation and just other you know, new features and things that are being added to it. Uh, so where that's a, a challenge we're still wrestling with at the moment. Um, uh, and then as Nikki was talking about, just the overall changes in the team. So uh, as you can see, in hindsight, we're, we're doing quite a few things differently, um, or we would do it if we were to, to start this project over again. Uh, but we have about 30 seconds, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll speak real fast. We're doing well at the timing, though. Um, yeah, so we had the crystal ball, and we've touched upon a couple of these already. So I think if we positioned it more as a program of work rather than a project with phases, I think that would have, A, made us more aware of how we can actually you know, be more cognizant of our resources and how we kind of bring people in and out of the project in a more structured way. 
Um, we didn't need to convert every single post meta field at once into a block. You know, maybe we could have been a little bit more strategic and thoughtful about that. Um, and one really big thing that I do want to touch upon is, um, you know, during the intensive site rollout phase, I think because we were moving so fast, if we'd had a dedicated bug team swarming on the feedback and the bugs coming in from the brands, doing a little bit of cleanup, whilst the rollout team went on to the next set of training, communications, QA, switchover, then I think that would have helped with where we are right now in terms of having to do quite a lot of cleanup. And also, honestly, help with the team stress levels as well, because there was just a lot going on this summer. Um, you know, I think having a more defined technical owner and architect um, across the project from the start, especially in that early R&D phase, um, and, you know, just generally more knowledge sharing, really kind of making sure that cross-team development and learning was happening within the wider team who were, who were just, you know, continuously developing and, and pushing out features for every, all, the, all the brands that were, you know, using the classic editor still. But I do want to say one thing, I know we're a minute over, but this project was successful. You know, as we saw, we have got hundreds of our editors using Gutenberg right now. And I, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are things to learn as always, but we did it. You know, and we, and we did it in actually a really, really fast timeline. So, yeah, and that's it. All right. Time for questions. Any questions? We'll pass mics around. Um, just raise your hand. We'll get it. A, get them to you. Oh. One right at the back. So I'm curious, uh, the performance benchmarks, what did you guys see from using your WYSIWYG to Gutenberg, and how did you measure your performance ben benchmarks after the migration? Which type of performance? So like Core Web Vitals, uh, load times, you know, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, to be honest, we didn't worry about that too much. Uh, between, you know, the, the front end didn't have uh, any huge changes. Um, in terms of things that we're loading on, on site, so we didn't really ha feel like we needed to look at that too much. Uh, we do keep a continual eye on our uh, core of vitals and didn't see any material change on our sites as we were going through the project. So Were you using lots of uh, short codes in the WYSIWYG before uh, Gutenberg, or did you have a page builder of some kind? Uh, not a ton, no. Um, so just pretty much straight content? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there would be embeds and a few short codes here and there, but... Uh, you know, our article content is, is pretty simple on our sites. Um, I, I would say it's a little bit different for some of our brands that have uh, affiliate links and, and e-commerce type content where you've got like buy buttons and things like that. Um, but that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the migration then, like the motivation was uh, the enhanced page builder experience, I suppose. Okay, yeah. Yeah. cool. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, there's a question right there. Oh, and right there. I'm actually wondering if you could do uh, dive a little more deeply for us into how you manage communication, training, and rollout for Gutenberg across the organization. Sure. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. And I've actually got a slide I prepared earlier on that question. So, <laughs> yeah, how do you know? I mean. <laughs> So I, I won't touch upon this too much because there is a lot to this, but you know, I mentioned a couple of things, you know, batching up our brands, um, starting with small brands with less custom post types, but I, you cannot underestimate the amount of thought that goes into planning your communications and training. We didn't just sit there and be like, oh, someone just write an email quick. Like we did a full communications plan. We did a full training plan. We scheduled out the breakdown of our training sessions. We explored getting an ex external trainer in. Luckily, we actually hired someone to join the product team who's got extensive training experience who managed to run with it in the summer, so we didn't have to. But you know, this, this, the, the planning of not just the brands, but also the impact on corporate teams, or at least them being aware of what's happening, I would say there's probably 30 to 40 hours worth of work going into that planning. Yeah. And so I think this is something that you know people 
especially if you're getting a crunch from execs to get this out. This is something that might be one of those areas that you think, oh, I just I can cut some corners there. You absolutely cannot, in my experience. And I, would, I do think this is one of the areas that we got really, really, really right. We did a lot of communications from HR, exec to exec, top down, bottom up, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was very, very thought out. Uh, I just want to add to that that you know we we knew pretty early on that this is something that we had to nail because this was really going to de uh, determine the success of the project, and we probably spent as much time on the training and rollout and hand holding through this as we spent on a lot of the build yeah. that we did. So uh, you know, like Nikki said, don't underestimate it. <laughs> Uh, sorry, just one quick question. Just if you had to cherry pick some of the features that you felt uh, got the editors to buy into the Gutenberg transition, what were ones that you would say really got them on board to say, all right, we're going to do this. This is going to make our life like much easier. Yeah, there's, there's one that really immediately comes to mind. So during the training sessions, um, we had set up the, um, you know, the Gutenberg editor for them to be able to toggle on where ads will appear within their content and where like related and other research modules appear. And so them being able to, in the editor, not having to preview, be able to see where the ads is going to break up their paragraphs or where research modules are going to sit, they loved that. And they still do to this day. Um, and the other thing is that there are some little, you know, there are things that as we're going through training, like being able to copy and paste easier from Word and things like that that are just so much more efficient in Gutenberg. It was, it was those it was little pain points that people just learned to live with over the last, you know, God knows how many years. That, that were, they were the things that they got really, really excited about. To ask the other half of the question implied earlier, can you speak at all to what metrics you had for time to publish and what guidance you might have for other publishers? Yeah, and that's a really good point. And that, this came to mind when that question was being answered earlier. We didn't do that. And I think we should have. You know, and I think it's something that we did more um, just through QA and a feel type thing. And I think we should have had some metrics around that for sure. I think that's definitely a learning. So. Right. We'll do one more question and then we'll wrap it up so we can stay on time. What was your strategy for reusing blocks across all your different products? So we're, we basically have a central plugin that's kind of our shim for Gutenberg. Um, we also use that for making Gutenberg templates work with our design system. Um, so we basically have all of our custom blocks in there. We had to recreate some of, our, some of the default Gutenberg blocks um, because of our design system. So we just have kind of a central library uh, of those in, in a plugin. Um, that's also kind of a, a general strategy that we have moving forward is we want anything that we're building to be shareable across any of our sites that are using the same underlying text. So make it just easier to turn features on and off across sites as we find them working. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.